All right, welcome to the LBs, the Lover of Books author chat. Now to introduce this wonderful debut novelist. Juhei Kim was born in, in pronounce it please, in so I don't mess it up. In Chun. In Chun. Korea and moved to Portland, Oregon at age nine. She graduated from Princeton University with a degree in art and archeology span and a certificate in French. Her debut novel, Beasts of a Little Land is an indie bestseller and was published in 2021 and has been since published around the world in 2022. She's the founder and editor of Peaceful Dumplings, an online magazine covering sustainable lifestyle and ecological literature. She's received fellowships from Broadleaf Environmental Writers Conference, Regional Arts Cultural Council and Arizona State University where she taught a class on ecological fiction as a 2020 Desert Nights Rising Star Fellow. She also is donating a portion of the proceeds from Beasts of a Little Land to the Phoenix Fund, a Siberian tiger and Amur leopard conservation nonprofit based in Vlad Vladivostok, Russia. Welcome so much, glad you can be here. Thank you so much. I am very excited to be here. Well, how about we just go ahead and, and dive right in because I know everybody has lots of questions and they just absolutely love this book. So your bio talks about international publications. Can you tell us where all this book has landed? Uh, sure. Um, firstly, it's coming out in Italy on Tuesday. So I'm very excited about that beautiful Italian cover. It's coming out on September 28th in Korea. I have had so many readers send me DMs on Instagram saying I loved your English edition and I have relatives in Korea and need to buy this for. When is it coming out? And I wasn't ever sure when it was coming out. And just a few weeks ago, my Korean publisher told me it's coming out September 28th. It's very bizarre because um, in the US, they set the publication date one year in advance and every nothing changes for one year. And I was so bamboozled that the Korean publisher chose this publication date pretty much like about a few weeks ago. And since then, I have asked um, authors who are active in Korea and they're like, yeah, that's totally normal. Don't be frightened. So there's a huge cultural difference there. It's also being published in France. I've seen the jacket recently. Um, uh, Spain, Russia, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, Turkey. Um, uh uk australia i might have forgotten a few here and there um but all six continents and i'm very excited about that what an accomplishment congratulations i mean that's just phenomenal a debut novel to have that kind of reach i mean it speaks for itself i think it's fantastic but what i want to know is do you have a favorite cover because i saw the italian one i have not seen anything on korea I don't know if you have, but there's some really pretty covers out there. Do you have a favorite? I haven't seen the Korean cover yet. <laughs> so the, again, the cultural difference is very shocking to me. The American cover was designed one year in advance and that's very normal for US publishing. And the Koreans, they decide the cover two weeks before the book comes out on shelves and they have domestic printing which is why all, all of this can work out. They, they're not printing this in China and then having it uh, shipped overseas like the US, they have their own printers. But even so, I'm wondering how is it possible you can decide the cover two weeks in advance? So we don't have a cover yet, but we know the launch date. Whoa. My favorite cover, probably the US, I'm very partial to it. I had a large um, part in designing the US cover. So- um, it's gorgeous. What was your part? Well, to be honest, the designer came up with three designs and I said no to all of them. And I said, you know, I, how about something like this? I pulled this image, which is the 10 longevity animals or 10 longevity creatures screen that is housed at the National Palace Museum of Korea. I pulled this image up and I said something like that you know, and they said, Echo said, we also want to include the tiger because we think the tiger is very important, it's symbolic, and it also sells really well. So <laughs> they came up with this design that juxtaposes the tiger with um, the screen. And this tiger is actually an illustration by an American artist in the style of the Korean traditional folk painting. And the reason that they did that is the actual folk paintings, we couldn't get one that was high enough resolution 
um, you know, they, the historic paintings tend to be lower resolution. We have to get permissions from the museum and even then it's not high quality. So we um, had this illustration uh, and I think the artist did such an amazing job because this composition, this asymmetric composition, um, the dynamism of the tiger looking this way while the body is pointing this direction. It's so dynamic. And even the tail is creating that S shape um, where everything's moving. And um, that's very representative of Korean aesthetic. And this face of the tiger that's ferocious as well as very whimsical and endearing, that is completely the spirit of the Korean tiger. So um, I think they did a wonderful job. Well, I absolutely loved it. I mean, everybody I've talked to, it's just, it's the first thing out of their mouth. I mean, it's so breathtaking and it's catchy. And it just, it, there's so much when, you, after you've read it, you can go back and really examine the cover. And it really means even more once you know the book in its totality. It's just, it's fantastic. I, I completely agree. I've had people say, um, I love the cover. I don't know what's inside. I just bought it because it's pretty. And I often just tell them, yeah, I hope the inside is just even half as good as the outside. <laughs> well, we think it is. Um, now for this process, I mean, did you have any say with your other publishers um, worldwide or was that more just with your U.S. cover? Oh, like the jacket process. So mm -hmm. um, I was very hands-on with the U.S. publisher. And then with the U.K. one, I held back a little bit. And then with the others, um, the non-Korean foreign publishers, I'm pretty much, I'm approving them as they come in, unless it's something that I'm like, absolutely not. Um, I'm being much more flexible, much less hands-on. And that's really because um, the further you are from your own market, like really, like, you know, it's, you, you can't try to have so much control over everything. Publishing as a process really is about giving up your idea of perfectionism and just rolling with the punches because so many things are outside of your control. So um, I am not being uh, very draconian with everybody else. I will probably be a little bit more intense with the Korean market because it means more to me. Um, obviously Korean readers will look at it in a different way than other um, other readers. So yeah, I, for example, for, with the US um, publisher Echo, I told them absolutely no women from the back or from below the eyes and down. Laura Beth, you're nodding your head. It's everywhere. It's like, it, it's, it's, there's too much of it. And I, I, I love the artistic value of this one because so much of the story was traditional, um, but, but forward facing, right? So I, I just, I, I think this was spot on and you made the right decision. Now, if their goal is September 28th, two weeks will be this Wednesday. So maybe we might see something on your Instagram page, maybe. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. As soon as I come up, I, I have the design and I have approved it on my end. I'm gonna put it all over social media because people deserve to find out. Yeah. They have been waiting. Long enough. That's exciting. Now the title, how did you come up with um, Beast of a Little Land? I didn't come up with it. It was my genius editor uh, or a genius agent, I'm sorry, Jody Khan. And when I was first drafting this and uh, at a very different place in my life, I had never written a novel before, you know, total newbie. And my agent is my only supporter. I said, I want to write a novel and call it Love and Time. You know, it has that epic feel like War and Peace, you know, or Pride and Prejudice. And she said, that's absolutely not the title we're going to call it. It sounds, um, it sounds boring. And I, I was just like, what about that is boring? It's, it, this, this story is actually about love and time. I really think about this as um, about those two themes, what happens to love as you go through time. It, and uh she thought, well, what about that scene where uh, Ito um, is talking about the zoo animals and he says, I don't understand how in this tiny little land that such enormous beasts could have flourished. And she was, she said, how about beasts of a little land from that passage? And immediately I was like, yes, that's the title. And 
title is usually the kind of thing that publishers, agents, um, editors, they all have different opinions on and everybody has a huge debate. But once we settled on Beasts of a Little Land, nobody wanted to touch it. They, are, they were so, so happy with it. And it just hit it out of the park. I mean, that, that is unusual because most of the time you hear change, 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 and then finally something sticks. So to have it that early on is, is impressive for your agent too. So uh, that's, that's pretty good. She definitely deserves her 15%. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, so you're a new writer. This is your first novel. What made you want to start this book? Like what was the seed? What was the, the inertia? What happened? Yeah, um, I wasn't planning on writing a novel. I had um, started out by writing short stories and it, it actually came about very organically. I didn't give myself permission to think of myself as a writer or as a working artist for a very, very long time. Although now that I am on this path, I think it's clear that I need to be walking this path. But as I might have mentioned before, um, I worked in book publishing in the editorial department. I cut my teeth as an editorial assistant, also called the EA. It's the bottom of the totem pole in a very cutthroat industry, a very misogynistic industry. It's frankly very racist. Um, it was at the time when I worked there. And I was so distraught because I am a hard worker and I went into it all wide eyed and I actually really loved books and um, really wanted to prove my worth, but they were never going to accept me as an insider. And so um, I ended up quitting my job and um, I started freelancing and on a whim really like one day I was just feeling very inspired and I wrote a short story and I really liked it and I was like wow I had never attempted to write literary fiction before but this this feels real so um I sent it to an agent I knew from working at Knopf and her name is Gail Hockman and she's um she's one of the partners at a boutique literary agency in New York Gail had always been very nice to me, even though I was only an assistant. So I sent it to her and she said, I'm not accepting new clients because um, you know, my client list is full. However, I can send this to my colleague who is building her list. And that was Jody. And Jody read it, she liked it, but she was like, this is only one story. I absolutely cannot take you on as a client after just one 5,000 word uh, short story. Please write me four more short stories. So I told Jody, just wait one month, I will write you four more stories. And then I wrote stories really, really fast. <laughs> and I sent it to her here, please accept me as your client. And um, she got back to me a couple months later and she said, okay, these five stories are good. They're good, but there's no way I can make a decision just based on five short stories. Can you make a collection length story collection, like a book length story collection. And um, this was in May. And I went running in Central Park because I was so upset um, that she just kept on asking me more and more, demanding more and more. But during my run, I calmed down enough and I was like, yes, I can do this. So I ran home and I got on my computer and I said, I will get you a book length collection by the end of summer. So I gave myself three months and I wrote so fast over those next three months. Um, and on August 31st, 2015, around 2 p.m., because I told her end of summer and I, I always follow through on my promises, I mailed 13 short stories, inclu including the five earlier ones. So I, I wrote additional eight. And then she didn't get back to me for another like two, three months. And I was like, what the hell? She asked me all these, um, she gave me all these demands. And then finally she got back to me at the end of October, maybe early November. And she said, I can't accept you as a client. <laughs> and so um, she, was, she was very complimentary. She said, you're clearly a, a writer that I appreciated hearing from her. She said, you're a writer, you're talented, your writing's very dreamy and beautiful. Um, dreamy is a word I continue to hear again and again. I think Jody was the first one who told me that. But they're all kind of sad and I don't think this is gonna be a hit. 
So um, I politely said, thank you so much for your feedback, taking the time to read. Um, but looking back, it really kind of is odd to me too that I pushed back a little bit and I said, here's why I made the decisions that I did artistically. And then she was like, okay, do you wanna to talk to me on the phone? And I was like, okay, yes, please. So it was a Friday night at around 7 p.m. in New York City. And I talked to her for an hour and she said, at the end of it, usually me trying to convince her why I made those artistic choices. And she, she was like, okay. And I was like, what? And she said, you have convinced me I will accept you as my client. So I remember like actually pumping my fists up and down like on the other end and being like, this is the happiest day of my life. Way to advocate. So, so but then, you know, you see how I wrote a bunch of short stories, but you, you see how my first book is a novel. So um, I, very soon after that, um, I waited only an appropriate amount of time before bringing up the fact that I was starving, like literally so poor that I was surviving on Goya beans and bulk oatmeal and um, wondering how, how I'm going to pay my next month's rent. Because at that time, I was living in Inwood in New York, um, a kind of a very low price neighborhood. And I remember sitting in a coin laundromat doing laundry so that other people can't steal my clothes and writing an email to Jody saying, I am sorry, I hope this isn't embarrassing to hear, but I'm actually really poor. And when can you sell my story collection? <laughs> <laughs> That's not how publishing works. But I asked her and she said, Juhei, I, I am saying this because I care about you and I care about your long-term career, but you need to write me a novel. I can't start your career off with the story collection. And so after that, I went running again in Fort Tryon Park this time, and it was a snowy day. And while I was running all upset because now I had written the wrong book, um, I, I had to now write a new one. Um, the scene of a hunter lost in the woods came into my mind. And then like, I could also see the tiger jumping into the scene. And it's very strange because all these scenes that are important um, parts of the book, but separated by decades and also containing different characters came into my mind. And I, one of the things that I already knew was um, that scene where jung Ho and Jade meet after many years apart, which is sort of the penultimate chapter of the book, um, maybe like second to last or maybe third to last chapter, very late. But I already knew what he was going to say to her. And so I came back and got on my computer and wrote what became the prologue. And it was pretty much, um, what you have in your hand now, because even though it went through so many different versions and so many different revisions, no one wanted to touch the parts that were inspired by that run, including what I just told you about the Jade and uh, Chang Ho reunion scene, that almost never changed. The prologue almost never changed. So um, that was all just from one sitting. And that's what became the seed of the book, like this um, elemental need to really create something. Um, a lot of the times uh, people seem to get into writer's blocks and um, wonder where does the inspiration come from. In my case, like the times of the greatest need and difficulty in my life actually pushed me to create. <laughs> I mean, I can see now why Jody says, you know, it's dreamy because when you start talking about the snow scene, I get the chills because that it almost has a dreamlike quality, that whole hunter part of the novel. It just, it feels so mystical. It's just, it's amazing. And it's a good thing you're a runner because it seems like all your, your thinking happens while you're moving. I bet you're running faster to get back to the apartment. Oh, oh yeah, I, just, I was <laughs> like, let's, let's not lose that thought. Laura Beth, I have actually stopped running. So goodness knows what that's going to mean for my writing. Maybe I won't have anything to write anymore. But um, right now I'm working on my next novel. I'm about two thirds of the way through what is a ballet novel or as like as I like to think of it, a love story between an artist and her art. Um, and while writing this, I haven't been running, but I have been religiously dancing. Like I just do ballet in my living room. 
and kind of like a method actor. I'm like all getting into the thought of a dancer, <laughs> not, not dancing like a professional dancer, but just experiencing all the hardship. <laughs> Well, and the movement, I think, alone is so lyrical. When you describe Jade's movement, I assume that you did possibly have some sort of dance background because as I, I grew up dancing and it just, it seems so natural. Have, do you have that background? Yes, yes. Um, so I started dance when I was nine. And although I never was good enough to even consider professional becoming a professional dancer, I did attend some very intense, like pre-professional ballet camps and such. Um, and uh, I always dance throughout my life. I think it's probably also the reason why I often introduce myself as author and artist as opposed to just writer. Um, on my website, I think it says author, artist, and advocate. And also the three A's thing is really easy to remember, but um, I don't just think of myself as a writer. Uh, I have always danced. I'm a classical musician, I'm a cellist. And even though I am a professional in none of those things, only as a writer do I make a living, my experience in these different forms of art absolutely inspire my writing and they feed my writing, maybe more than just the writing or the reading of other books. It's very strange how it works for me. And I think that's also why it, it helps to create the dreaminess and also um, I get cinematic a lot about my writing. I always have gotten the word cinematic attached to me. And I think it's because I studied art history um, that I have that. Maybe also that I study dance. Like I am seeing things very visually in my head as I write. So, um, well, I think it's beautiful. Emily, I heard Emily St. John Mandel say music does the same for her. So mm -hmm. um, I believe she plays the piano or some other instrument, and that's where her art feeds into her writing. And wow. so, you know, I think people pull upon their backgrounds to feed their passions, right? And you found yours, and we certainly are glad you have. Um, so in this story, um, you talk, the one part, another part that gave me the chills was the scene where the student makes the speech mm. to announce freedom. Is that something that's historically correct, that speech? Yeah. Okay. So Laura Beth, I love hearing that from somebody who isn't Korean and who doesn't have a prior knowledge of that statement, which is the Declaration of Korean Independence. It's an actual historical speech that was given at a park on that day, March 1st, uh, 1919. And I had the original in Korean and I translated it actually myself into English. And while I was translating, I was crying because it meant so much to me. I've heard a lot from Korean readers that that scene made them cry because it, it they know what this means. But I am even more like touched to hear that you don't need to have that background. You don't need to have that shared history to appreciate the bravery of people who are willing to fight this, knowing that there's no way that they're gonna win, knowing most likely they will be crushed by violence, but choosing to be nonviolent because it was very deliberately a nonviolent peaceful protest. And it had reverberations throughout the world, I believe. Um, at that time in early 20th century was when India, for example, was fighting for its own independence. You know, um, early 20th century was also very inspired by um, Tolstoy, his belief in um, peaceful humanitarianism. So it was a kind of a worldwide moment and um, Koreans were saying, this is how we're gonna choose to fight this. And it didn't work. So um, definitely a, a very important thing that all Koreans know by heart uh, that you know is passed down to us as generational trauma. And something that I am, I, to my knowledge, I am the only, this is the only book published by a major American publisher that depicts this pivotal moment in Korean history. So I was very happy um, that it resonated. It's so impassioned. I mean, it was, to me, it was universal. It was something that had my heart pumping and my breath was shortened. It was, it was just so I don't know. It just, it, it, it didn't feel 
just Korean. It felt universal to me. It was, it was beautiful. And so I'm so glad that you translated and you've had some translation um, experience in the past. I saw you, you, did you translate a novel? Uh, was it, I looked sorry. to the I, the only thing I wanted to address was from Anne. Bravery seems to yes. be throughout the novel, uh, exemplified by several of the characters. And absolutely, like courage is courage is actually my probably my most important value. Um, and so I'm glad that that was picked up on. I think um, Maya Angelou said that courage is the most important virtue because without it, you can't practice any of the other virtues. And I find that it's it's one of my main themes in life. So thank you for pointing that out, Anne. Um, the translation that I made was a short story. And that was a, quite, of a, quite a magical thing as well because um, that translation would never have been published if it were not for the fact that I was like in the deepest, darkest moment of my life. Um, I had just quit New York because I had, I was in the middle of writing Beast. I had already drafted it once or twice and Jody kept saying it's not good enough. I hadn't published new short stories at all. And to be honest, it was really hard because I was living as a full-time editor in New York and not sleeping at all. I was working on my um, Peaceful Dumpling website or my novel from 10 to 2 a.m. in the morning, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. in the morning and then 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning. Uh, in the morning again before work for three years straight. So I was at the end of my rope. And so the only choice left for me at that point because I was getting sick so much from never um, taking a break, I decided to quit my job and without any promises, um, no new job offers, just move out of the city. So I put all my stuff at my parents' house and um, in Portland and I decided to go to France for three months to learn French <laughs> and actually chase my joy for the first time in my life. And um, I was still really devastated though because I, I think I was at that point, um, this was 2019, three years ago. So I was 32. I had thought that by 32, I would have something really great to show for, um, like a novel, and I hadn't accomplished that, and I felt like a failure, to be honest. So um, very sad, and right around New Year's, um, I decided I, I had just booked my flight um, to France, and I decided, you know, on my way to France, I'm probably going to need to do a stopover in London, and I wonder if I should have a meeting with my granta editor, Luke. Luke. Um, and I hadn't spoken with him since 2016. He actually acquired and published the very first short story I'd ever written that I sent to Jody. And she was like, this is great, write me four more. So he was the one who published that in 2016, but I hadn't talked to him at all. But something told me that, you know, stop being, um, sh stop being timid and go out there and make things happen. So I emailed him feeling very scared of rejection and he was very nice to me. And he's like, yeah, come to the office, let's have coffee. So I was super excited about this. And in the back of my mind, I was wondering, should I pack this book by Che In-ho? And uh, Che is the late great Che In-ho is one of 20th century's most important Korean authors. Very seldom published internationally, but in Korea, he's a huge monumental figure. E everybody knows who he is. And I have a favorite book by him. And it's a book, of, it's mostly for children, but it's also partially, um, Fables for Adults, and hit the, the Fables for Adults are my some of my most favorite um, short stories that I've ever read anywhere. I had this feeling in my mind that I might talk to Luke about them and that I might translate these for him without ever having translated anything in my life and not having ever met Luke. So I thought about packing it in my French suitcase, but I didn't because it, was, I, it seemed like overkill. I go there in London and I start talking to him and he has this um, 
postcard of the cover for Han Gang. Uh, you know, everybody knows Han Gang, the vegetarian. Human Acts, the vegetarian. She won the Man Booker International Prize for her book, um, Vegetarian. She's a very well-known Korean author. Granta is her UK publisher and had um, he had the postcard of her latest book on his desk. And I, we started talking about Han Gang and I was like, you know, there was that controversy with the vegetarian, um, the quality of the translation. And I told him, quite frankly, I read it both in Korean and in English. And the English translation is vastly different from the quality of the Korean original. I, I had to say that, like, I care too much about literature to just varnish uh, my true opinion just because they're her publisher. The Korean language, the original is very rough. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not very polished. And then the English one, made it very palatable for um, the English uh, Anglophone audience. So he was like, who do you think is a really good Korean author that I should be reading? And I was like, you know, there's this author that I love called Chain Ho. And he was like, oh, why don't you translate something and send it to me? So as soon as I got out of that meeting, which like happened just like I could have dreamed of that scenario, I told my mom to scan a bunch of pages for me and then as soon as I landed in France, I didn't even go out to eat. I just holed up in my Airbnb for 24 hours, translating his short story that I love from the bottom of my heart. And then I sent it to Luke and then he published it. So I guess the moral of that story is, and then, you know, you don't make any money when you're translating. Short stories don't make money. Translation is really just a labor of love. The only thing that really pays the bills is if you write a book length novel or you know that gets uh, optioned off for film tv that that's not big you don't do things like that for money you do things because you feel like this story is so good other people should read it and the world should know about this right so that was the beauty of that moment for me and another beauty of that moment for me is there there have been moments in my publishing career where I felt like there was no hope anymore. And just by, just by offering myself up selflessly to art, that's when I feel like there was the saving grace. Um, I don't know if there are any aspiring writers out there, but you know, this is a road paved with thorns. But if you just keep on giving yourself to art, I think that there are those moments when you really break through the wall, the brick wall. Well, how, so you take your translations because you have done this, like you had to take and translate the Korean um, manifest, basically of, of freedom. What other things did you have to do for this novel? Like to use that experience, right? To bring all those experiences into Beasts of a Little Land. Uh, so I get to ask this question a lot. How did you do the historical research? And I don't want to make light of the fact that uh, yes, it's a historical novel and like there's a lot of information that I had to know and digest. The research part felt easy to me and A, it's because I speak and read and write fluent Korean. So I had access to firsthand materials and B, I have been reading history books in Korean about Korea as long as I can remember. I was such a little, little nerd and I was a big fan of history books in Korea, like from ancient times, there were these um, also medieval annals and chronicles, and they sound boring, but they really were mesmerizing even to a little kid because Korean medieval annals tend to be, tend to be woven together with legends and myths. So they're very rich and fun. And um, I grew up absorbing all of that. And then I, I, of course, read a lot of biographies growing up, um, biographies of independent activists, all the stuff that happened in early 20th century. So uh, historical research came super organically. I felt like I was, I had been doing this, compiling information pretty much my, all my life. So it came down to checking 
you know, the details, knowing all the chronology, of course, like the dates and knowing all the nuances, because there are a lot of nuances that I didn't include for the benefit of the American audience. But, you know, the Korean readers might know the sh different different kinds of communist parties. You know, there's just one communist party that's in the book. I'm not gonna tell you like three or four different communist parties, but it was very complicated at the time. I simplified everything. And even then it's probably still um, pretty complex, but I think at the end of the day, people were able to understand the gist of what we're working with. Well, I'm gonna read a quote because I thought I loved this part of the book. It says, I lived in a boarding house near the harbor for a month, just reading and writing from morning until nightfall. After dark, I would light a candle in to keep going. And it was possible to believe that there was nothing in the world except myself and my books. It felt like my room was a cabin of a ship somewhere out in the middle of the ocean. Is this describing your experience? Because it felt so personal that I mean, I'm picturing you now in the Airbnb in France hold up kind of the same way, but is that how you write? Is that your, is this, is this Juhei in the, in the novel? Oh, Laura Beth, you are so smart. <laughs> and I will say that I will not say that it was like the exact same experience, but let me tell you where I was living at the time when I was writing Beast of a Little Land. I was living on West 47th Street in Manhattan between 10th and 11th Avenues. If anybody has been to New York or lived there, that's Midtown West, all the way almost near the Hudson River. And this is not a very glamorous neighborhood, but I, and not at all a very glamorous apartment. It was fifth floor walk up, no air conditioning, insect screen was broken. I got bitten by mosquitoes around the year and it was horrible. I had to do my laundry outside also, uh, all sorts of difficulties, but I had a sliver of Hudson River View just from my uh, kitchen window where I could see um, a sliver of the sunset. And because I was so close to the river, I could hear the foghorns of the ships. And that was such a soothing thing. That was the one priceless thing I had in that very poor apartment and it healed me. The sound healed me and I, that's that's where that came from. <laughs> I loved it. It felt it felt personal to me. It felt I could just see you. I mean, it's sort of like you and the character combined there for a second. So it's nice to thank you for sharing something so personal with us. Um, I do want to go into a little bit about the themes. I know that Anne brought up bravery, um, but I want you to talk a little bit about the threads. Is it Inyon? How do you pronounce that? Inyon. In Inyon. Okay, I got it right. How I want to talk about that theme because that seemed to be so essential throughout. And, and why did you bring it up and, and why is it so important to this novel? I think of uh, Inyon as one of the fundamental blocks of the Korean paradigm. So Korean paradigm is just how Koreans see the world, right? Their worldview. And Koreans think that everything is predestined, it, it all fits together. There's no coincidences in, in the way we experience reality. So for example, um, you know, my sister, she's a scientist, but and she's extremely rational, US raised, you know, she was born in Korea as was I, but she still believes, and I believe her, that when she was little, she had a dream where our great-grandmother um, jumped in front of, uh, so there is a Korean um, character called Chosung Saja. It's a Korean grim reaper. They're all dressed in black and they come and get you um, when you're ready to die. The, the grim reaper, the Korean grim reaper tried to take me away in my sister's dream. But my great grandmother jumped in front of me and said, do not take her, she's too young, take me instead. And my sister claims that a few days after she had this dream, my great grandmother died. And my sister is, again, she, she did her postdocs at Cornell and NYU, she's a scientist, super, super rational and very far removed for, from superstitious of any kind really, but she believes this, I believe this. And so Koreans think that your ancestors watch over you 
in life and in death. We really believe this. And we believe that these ties, this, these blood ties, grandmothers to grandchildren, father, son, um, mother, daughter, husband, wife, these are unbreakable ties in the way we, re we experience reality. And I wanted to capture that. So well, that's why it's such a big part of the novel because it's really how we experience our lives. Well, Danny has one of those premonitions as well when she names the girls flowers. And that really comes full circle. I know with Luna and the cosmos, when it comes back at her wedding, um, I didn't pick up the sunflower for Lotus, but it was very important for Jade when she gets down um, with the sea women because the, the camellia is there as well. And so it's really a, it's almost like these women have this ability, or at least some of them, Danny has this ability to predict in a certain way, mm. um, predict life. And uh, you know, one of the reviews like from New Internationalist, the UK publication said that there is a pleasing circularity, um, that satisfying circularity to the way these premonitions come in and out and it all kind of fits together at the end. And I would say, it's kind of similar to the way we think about time. In Western culture, of course, time is completely linear. Linear. In, um, in other cultures though, in a lot of other cultures, um, in Eastern as well as indigenous cultures, it's considered circular, it's seasonal. And I think that uh, the world of Beasts of a Little Land it's not just beginning all the way to the end in like one race, but it's, it comes together in full circle. Yeah. I mean, the same goes with the ring and with the, 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 the holder, the silver. Um, you know, I, I think that, that I love that you dropped those clues at the beginning because it kept us like, when's this going to come up again? When's this going to come up again? It was, it was like you were dangling that carrot for us, which I always appreciate um, following along. Um, um, especially when it's written so beautifully. So I thought that was awesome. And I did love the threads. And it almost seems like not just ancestors watching after, but friendships can do the same thing. So with Jung Ho and, and Jade, it's like he knew to be there when she needed him most. That thread sort of pulled and he was there, you know? And I thought that was a beautiful connection, even though we weren't really talking about the intro. And then it, it was really, I really appreciated that part of that relationship. What was your symbolism behind the tiger? Oh, is she off? Oh, wait. Yes. Sorry, I had a fire truck. I live right next to the fire station. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I've got to mute myself. Uh, <laughs> repeat the question one more time for me. Sure, I was just going to ask, what, why the tiger? Why did you put the tiger in? So, the tiger came to me organically, right? It came mm -hmm. to me as an image in the middle of my run. I think multiple layers of this. Um, one, one, I grew up reading these folk tales, um, Korean folk tales, and Korea is an extremely narratively rich land, uh, thousands of legends and myths. And you also have this oral tradition where the grandmother tells the grandchildren these um, these old tales and they always begin, you know how Western fairy tales always begin with once upon a time. Mm -hmm. The Korean fairy tales begin with long, long ago, so long ago that uh, tigers smoked pipes. So Korea, there are these long pipes that Korean traditional um, men traditionally used to smoke. And, but they're saying it was so long ago that the tigers used to smoke. Um, tigers, not only feature at the beginning of the fairy tale, they are the most frequent character, the most frequent protagonist in these, uh, in these stories. And they serve such an important purpose. They are courageous. They, are, um, they can be cowardly. They can be super smart. They can be stupid. They can be funny. They always repay their debts. They can be generous. So they have all of these qualities that humans have. And through that, you can really feel how closely our ancestors um, felt a kinship with these enormous beasts who were actually apex predators in a tiny piece of land. If you look at the globe, Korea is super small landmass. 
70% of the landmass is mountainous. So very little land left for human habitation. And in this land, these enormous tigers, man-eating tigers were living and they were painting them, portraying them in a actually very endearing light. And I find that very touching because it shows that Koreans had this natural reverence for these creatures and ability to live harmoniously with um, what can be very dangerous beasts. So I had this extreme fondness for um, the Korean characters in the folk tales, in our folk, in our folk paintings. And another thing too is my grandfather, my mother's father, who was a Korean independence fighter. I grew up hearing tales about how he played a part in the Korean independence movement. And he was an actually very interesting character because um, he was tall and he was extremely strong and very athletic. My mom said that he um, was uncommonly athletic, gifted. And he also had very light golden brown eyes. That's very uncommon for Koreans. Um, as you can see, my eyes are so dark, they look black. That's normal. But um, he had noticeably golden brown eyes that my mom thought that it's because his family um, is originally from the North and maybe they had intermarriage with uh, the Russians maybe. Um, they, she felt that he could have had that, but it was a strange characteristic and I think on some subconscious level, now I think about it, and I think the hunter and the tiger leaping into that scene, I, I almost feel like the tiger, um, the tiger's yellow eyes um, that are mentioned in the prologue, maybe it came from my subconscious of ha having a grandfather with these golden brown eyes. Um, so it's, it's partly mythology of Korea, it's partly mythology of my own family. Well, it sounds like they tried in the fables to make tigers and humans mix, like the tigers have those a human-like quality. And then in the end, that's sort of that circular theme when we finally get to find out who that tiger is, right? When he finally right. tells the story that it's, that it's believed to be his mother. So I found that absolutely fascinating. And I wanna agree, Liz brought up a, a beautiful comment and I wanna read this out loud. And she says, I so much appreciate your passion, your bravery, your courage, your wisdom, and your perseverance. It's so inspiring. And so Tiger-like, like the fact that you were advocating and doing this, even though you were in an industry where you were pushed down for so long, and that doesn't necessarily give it all to minorities. You made a space for yourself in the story, and we thank you for it. So thank you, Liz. I didn't even read that bottom part. I only read up to the part, like maybe up to the wisdom part, but it's so true. Thank you so much for understanding that because even though it seems like there are a lot of Asian, Asian American books that are being written right now, um, actually it's not that, it's, it's not that simple. Um, so for example, something like a, around 95% of book editors in the US are white. Um, it, 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 it ranges from 92 to 96. And I think it also depends on like when you pull them. The year I saw was probably from around 2018. Also around 95% of US critics are white. That leaves very little room for non-white people to be making decisions about books, um, decide which books go on the market and also which books win awards, which books sell a lot. and um, I, I was very surprised by um, how closed the gate is for non-white people when I was working there as an author. So um, it did take a lot of bravery, but I think that um, readers make it all worthwhile. It's been incredible. I can't even tell you that my US publisher, which has been great, and if somebody from Echo is watching this, I'm sorry. Echo has been great overall, but you know, it's it's not the publisher who has your back, it's the readers. And readers surprised me the most with their love. I didn't anticipate it. I wanted it to be read by my mom and appreciated and you know, like maybe a few people, but the way readers came and supported this book and um 
it's, it's just been mind blowing. And yes, I agree with you that the tiger is the most reminiscent because people are always like, you're Jade, aren't you? And I'm like, no, Jade was such a difficult character for me to write. Um, I always thought in terms of humans, I would say Myungbo is my most similar parallel because he's very altruistic. And ever since he was little, he was just giving away what it, whatever he had to classmates and stuff. And that's like from my life. I, I was always like giving stuff away and trying to help. Um, but among the all the characters, I would say the tiger is definitely me. Um, all right, guys, if you want to ask a question, Go ahead and be thinking of that. Raise your hand. I'm going to ask some quick questions while everybody's getting their thoughts together. Are you ready? All right, JK. All right, research or writing? Pick one. Writing. All right, writing morning or night? Night. Paper or computer? Computer. Oh, God, paper sounds terrible. <laughs> Detailed outline or wing, or wing it? Wing it. Lotus or Luna? Oh, uh mm, it is okay just just don't think too hard yeah don't lotus, think lotus future author bff oh uh, future author bff yeah do you have a do you have a, like an author bff like that you oh you i do i do i do um uh, my author bff is probably uh coco malores she wrote cleopatra and frankenstein very good yeah. all right the smells of your hometown smells uh you, you described soul so i want to know your smells <laughs> teeter <laughs> specific and i say it with so much confidence That's right. um, <laughs> teeter smells wonderful it's like my favorite tree i love it all right your favorite season fall and your favorite korean dish uh favorite korean dish kimchi fried rice yum all right, thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot, but those are always fun. No, All right, any, any, <laughs> you did fantastic. Does anybody want to raise their hand and ask a question? Because we have it. If not, I will continue um, to ask. All right, I've got more. All right, um, let's talk about the, the fund because I want to know why you chose to donate, how you learned about this fund, and, and sort of how that process worked. I always knew that um, I was going to donate a portion of my author proceeds to um, a cause, because to me, being an artist is inseparable from trying to make the world a better place. This is a very specific thought, and it's not a very modern or hip thought, and I think um, the idea of the public intellectual having responsibility to lead and better the world has really fallen off the cliff. Um, it, it's become a very pure art oriented and that's fine. We have, you know, it's okay to have different styles, different philosophies about being an artist. But to me, um, me being an artist isn't just to see my name on the cover of a book. It has to, um, you know, leave the world a better place and because of the book, because of the nature of this book, I thought uh, conservation of the tiger and the leopard really was a cause that um, fit really well. And in selecting the fund, I wanted to work with a grassroots organization that is really working with the feet on boots on the ground and very nimble. Because if you donate to um, a huge organization with fancy website, international presence, that comes with a large overhead, especially if you have um, staff that is working out of places like New York, right? So um, I'm really happy to be working with the Phoenix Fund um, based in Vladivostok and their super on the ground organization. And what they do is very special because um, they reach the children through arts education. So they have two two main um, branches of work that they do. One is arts education. They um, teach children to uh, love nature and love tigers and through these festivals, through art contests, through writing. And that's exactly how I became a lifelong nature lover and environmentalist. I, I grew up reading these books and fell in love with nature even though I was living in a city. So I know that that works. And Another beautiful thing about that is 
those kids that they, they then go home and they tell their parents and then their parents become more mindful. And that's important because this uh, Primorsky Far East area is very poor. The poachers of tigers and tiger prey animals are people who live there and don't have other resources. So by teaching their children, they're actually reaching out to their parents and making them care about nature and to not turn to poaching or illegal, illegal activities, which I think is very important. Number two, they empower um, the anti-poaching units. And another problem with anti-poaching units is that they don't make a lot of money. So they're susceptible to bribes from poachers. So you incentivize them, you arm them with um, better technology, you incentivize them with bonuses, you also track their work because by um, with technology. So you reward them for more miles covered and better poaching activity, anti-poaching activity. So I thought that how they're doing it is really wonderful. And uh, they the, another thing that they taught me is that animals that are on the brink can come back. So the Amur leopard actually fell to 90 individuals left in the wild. And um, now they're up to 110. And you know, you think, well, that's just very, very small, but they are actually coming back. That's a significant increase, right? Like little by little. Species that have gone fallen down even lower than that have successfully come back. So it's, worthwhile fighting, even, even if you feel like it's a losing fight. However, how you do it isn't by just giving one time and just saying, okay, that felt good and forgetting about it. You make a difference with the cause. If you pick a cause that you deeply care about and you give sustained effort for a long period of time. They told me right at the beginning when I joined in the call with them and uh, discussed our partnership that don't expect to see results after five years. But they said, expect to see results after 20 years, after 30 years, after 50 years. That's what we're talking about. And they're, they're doing that, that kind of work. So that gives me this idea that as an advocate, I want to continue to talk about these causes and support them in the long term. Um, worldwide sales, like every country, 5% of my um, pre-tax income is going to that cause. And it will as long as this book is in print. So um, it, if you guys have a cause that you care about, I please, um, I would like to ask you to think long-term, um, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be a tiger or a leopard. If, if there's something you care about, um, please care about it for a long time. Well, I actually had a question. It says, do you believe that there are people with money and power like Myungbo that are so selfless or is it, or is he just an example of humankind? And you just answered it because you're that person and someone, you know, it's so obvious now that your life parallels in a lot of ways, his selfless giving. And it's just wonderful to hear it in, in, in its reality. So it's beautiful. So I, I want to say uh, what's name, whose name was that? Um, who was the person who asked that? Me, that was one of my oh, that questions. Was, that was, that was and you just answered it. Okay. So, so Laura Beth, I, I also want to add that Nongbo was inspired by actual historical figures during that time who were leaders in that society, who were landowners and they sold everything and they gave it to the poor and then they used the rest for independence. They were actually such selfless figures. And we have to remember this was pre-Stalin. Communism hadn't yet been proven and um, put to the test of history. It right. was a new idea and they really believed it. They were idealists. So um, they put it into practice. And even though there were such ills and I, I am not a North Korea um, advocate whatsoever, um, you know, they're committing atrocities there as well. At that time, um, the socialists and communists who were so selfless and idealists, I want to honor that. I want to honor their sincerity um, I think that's what we need more of in the world, sincerity. So um, thank you for pointing that out and uh, bringing that to the attention. Well, Ju Young had a question. What are some Korean history or historical fiction books that inspire your writing or that you'd recommend? And I would like to add to that. Um, it doesn't just have to be Korean. I would just like to know what books in general you'd recommend to us. So um, I mentioned uh, my 
uh, author BFF, Coco. And uh, Coco's book, Cleopatra and Frankenstein, very different. It's contemporary and it's a much sexier book. Uh, but I related to it deeply, maybe because I also lived in New York, but I loved it. So um, I loved that book and I highly recommend it. In terms of, um, what's the name of the book? Cleopatra and Frankenstein. And um, in terms of historical fiction, I was actually most inspired by um, this epic novel about Korean independence, independence movement called Arirang, written by an incredibly important Korean author, Cho jong Le. Not, never been translated into English, but I read this when I was very little and it inspired me deeply. It's like a 20 volume work and it's, it, that's an epic. Like this has been described as an epic and sure, um, but that was like, took up an entire shelf, right? And um, that uh, was probably the most um, direct ancestor of this book in a way, and I also was hugely inspired, inspired by Tolstoy. I mentioned Tolstoy being a humanitarian and pacifist, and that spirit also touched me, but in terms of my literary inspiration, his Anna Karenina is the most perfect novel, in my opinion. I read The Master and Margarita by Bulgakov, and I thought that might be a better work of art, but I still maintain that Anna Karenina is the perfect novel. <laughs> have you have you read either of those? I haven't read the second one. I've read Anna Karenina, but I have not read oh, the other. Okay. I cannot okay. make a comparison. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I, I obviously there's something about Russia that really inspires me because I, I love Russian novels. I love Russian ballet. I love Russian composers. So I have always felt this um, affinity toward their culture. And now I'm supporting a, a Russian nonprofit. Uh, nothing to do with Ukraine. I like. I fully, fully support Ukraine, but um, but yeah, I I brought up Master and Margarita because it's probably the most recent classical masterpiece that I read that just like blew my head into bits and pieces, and I didn't know what to do with myself for like the following week. I was so shocked, in awe, well, and I think uh, in, the, in the chat oh, she agrees with you. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, and I think that felt less to me like a novel, but it, it was a perfect work of art. And I think it's because Bulgakov was also a playwright. So it has a different feeling than a novel. And as a novel, it gets pretty baggy in the middle. And I think by the standards of current US publishing, I think the editor would step in and say, cut all of this out and make this better. But that's what's wonderful about the classics. There was a time in publishing maybe also there are countries that still do this, that author was given artistic license to just kind of let themselves free. And it would usually result in something that's less manicured, more wild, but also kind of also more genius and precious in a way. And I think um, the demands of current US publishing, it leads to books that are more cookie cutter and e easily palatable. But I, I, I love seeing that wildness of, the previous generations. Well, I think I think your wildness is what what got and explaining your wildness is what got her on board for your short stories. So uh, to keep it coming. Um, now you did say it was mentioned that you were described as cinematic. Any sort of talk about making this book into something on film? So you know I am repped by United Talent, which is like one of the three big US, uh, Hollywood agencies and they have been taking it around and I haven't heard any good news. You know, authors usually also, when you ask questions like this or they play coy, they don't want to sound weak by revealing that they haven't sold yet. I mean, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I already told you what my next book is about. It's not even under contract. The reason being, I think that I, in, my, in my life, I've experienced so many ups and downs and it didn't do me any good when I was hiding. Like when I was like, mm, I don't know if it's gonna sell. So let me just keep this a secret. It didn't help me at all. It's when I was actually committing it, committing to it, telling people about it and you know, just saying, I don't care. Like, this is what I am about owning my shit that really puts a different energy in, into the universe and it really worked in my favor and um, I'm all about that. So uh, hasn't sold yet. I would love to see it 
adapted. I think it's it would make an amazing film or a series. Everybody has told me this. It, it re I mean, it reads so beautifully that it feels like it, it was a movie in my head, really. It was just, or theater. I mean, I could almost picture it on the stage too. I thought it was really beautiful. Now we are over time, but there is one more question. Do you want to, um, do you want to answer that or do we need to, or do you so have some more? Yeah. I, well, I feel like people want to go eat dinner and stuff. <laughs> I, wanna, I, I just want to read what, and Donna, thank you. I, I know your name. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, do you feel as if the characters in Beast have joined your family in a sense? Oh yeah, I mean, I feel like they're actual human beings. I, it, it does feel that way for sure. And um, yes, family is everything. I think, um, uh, Renee, I, did you say that you were Korean at all? No. Um, Cause I remember your handle from Instagram, um, but maybe you weren't Korean uh, heritage, but uh, in my culture, family is so important. And I gotta say um, a lot of Koreans and Asian parents in general dissuade their children from pursuing the artistic path. But my parents never told me don't do something like that. Um, they never told me to go to law school and they were always behind me, no matter how bumbling around I must have seemed to them. You know, I graduated from a good school and instead of getting a high, high paying job, I was literally going from one starving station to another and um, getting older and older without proving my worth. And I was, I got really concerned for myself, but my parents were always behind me, which is why I knew that this book couldn't have been made without them. Amanda, oh, Amanda, so good to see you. <laughs> uh, Amanda, you didn't need to include your handle because I, I know your first and last name. If, if you say Amanda Shaw, I know who you are, but I didn't think that you'd be here and it's so nice to be. See. No, I'm, I'm definitely here. I had to put my kids to bed, so I missed the the first little bit. But it's been amazing, and I I got an arc of Beast for everyone else like, way back in November, and it was actually one of the first books I reviewed for my Bookstagram when I first started it, and it's changed the way I read and think about books, even though I've been reading my entire life and I fell in love with this book and I keep telling everyone I can possibly read to read it. And my daughter's middle name is actually Jade. So I have this deep connection to it. Um, and I can't wait to share this book when, when she, she's only four, but um, when she's much older. Um, I, and I know you said you wanted to go, but I just have one very quick question. Um, is the, will the book be published in Japan? And how do you, one, how do you feel about that? Yes or no? And just in the spirit of making the world a better place and since Jade is, represents love and harmony, you know, does that come into it as well? That was my question, if so, we could sneak it in. <laughs> so I'm not the person who decides where it gets published. Echo acquired world rights and Echo's foreign rights team pitches this book to other foreign publishers and whoever buys it, buys it. I mean, they can also say no. I, I haven't been published in like hundred countries, right? I don't know if they ever pitched to Japan. I, that is an interesting idea. I don't think that that's a natural fit. Japan, is of course, um, I actually, I don't know if it's an of course. Do you, most people probably don't know, but Japan is a very conservative society, even today. Japan, even today, has a sizable ultra conservative population that are all about imperial glory. And it is actually quite striking. They have um, radical rights, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's quite xenophobic. It can be quite racist toward Koreans still. And um, they don't teach their history of occupying Korea in their classrooms. Uh, I had somebody, I had a reader, an American reader who went to college in Japan, read the English uh, it, American edition and DM me and say, I never learned this going to university in Japan. They didn't teach any of the Japanese colonial, colonialization of Korea. So granted that, I don't think the publishing landscape is right for them to publish this book. Having said all of that, I think it's 
it's individual. I'm not saying Japan is all like racist at all or that they forget history. I think individual Japanese people make the choices that they make and some of them are informed and incredibly compassionate toward this. I also want to include that while doing research, I had examples of Japanese people during the colonial period saying, we should not be oppressing Koreans and some of them went to jail for it. Some of them wrote novels about it. Some of them marry Koreans um, and bravely died with their Korean spouses. I didn't include them in this book because it gets baggy, right? It needs to make narrative sense. Just because some people did it and I find it moving doesn't mean they all have to make an appearance here. I want to stress though that all across the border, there are sides to, um, there are people on all sides. There were good Japanese people back then. There are good Japanese people now. And um, I really truly believe that the spirit of this book isn't calling anyone out, but remembering history and at the same time remembering what good we are capable of. Definitely. Thanks so much, Amanda, for that question. I will um, go ahead and thank Juhei so much for, for tonight. It's been a wonderful and enlightening experience. Please out there, please make sure and check out her website, check out her Instagram for the latest news. We're going to be looking for that news on your Korean release and the cover. And also for everyone out there, please follow the LBs, the Lover of Books, either on Facebook or on Instagram. I'm going to try to have this recording up on YouTube in a couple of days. So check that out if you missed part of it. Next Sunday, September 18th at an earlier time. So it's going to be 4 p.m. Eastern time. She's in the UK. I'm hosting author Jillian McAllister for her New York Times bestselling wrong place wrong time come see why new york times bestselling author lisa jewel says this is it's perfection every word every moment a masterpiece one of the best books i've ever read you don't want to miss it thank you mike for handling behind the scenes if you have an author that you want to hear from let me know and please subscribe to my youtube channel it's been a fantastic night i'm so excited i just i love this book thank you so much for sharing it all with us i read every single one of your comments Thank you so much. Like you guys are the reason I continue to write and um, I, I, my heart is full. Thank you. I hope you all have a wonderful night. Good night.